Welcome to the Scholar's Chair. Tonight, a discussion concerning the concept of religious freedom from the American and Islamic perspectives. In the Scholar's Chair tonight is author and educator Dr. Madadine Ahmed. Dr. Madadine Ahmed was born en route to the United States when his family left Palestine in 1948. He was raised in Pennsylvania and graduated with a bachelor's degree from Harvard University in 1970 and a doctoral degree in astronomy and astrophysics from the University of Arizona in 1975. At Focus, is there religious freedom in the religion of al-Islam? And if not, can Americans coexist with the difference? Our discussion will take place right here in the Scholar's Chair. Let the conditions of inequality that we suffered under, when we are the oppressor, the, the dominant class, let's not impose that injustice on the others. Anybody think that you could have a just system without giving women their rights? Everyone has an opinion, and we sit around the marketplace and talk about opinion, but what is true? With the shareholder, their goal is similar to the business, to maximize profit. That belief becomes a context for a development of knowledge. Say physics is the DNA of technology because the rules for how you build new technology starts in physics. Because Quran challenges mm -hmm. the people. It's not only the people of the book. It challenges Muslims. We say secular. They hear godless. Right. What was intended? Watch the scholar's chair every Monday night. And here is your host. Ahmed, welcome to the scholar's chair. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Madadine, you've written this very impressive article in the uh, University of Pennsylvania Journal of Constitutional Law back in 19, uh, actually 2006. <laughs> and uh, I want to know, uh, the title is American Muslim Perspective on uh, Freedom of Religion. Why did you write the article? What was the motivation? Well, actually, <clears throat> I was asked to write the article by a member of the editorial staff of the Law Journal, and I was happy to do so because I felt that the Islamic contribution to the issue of freedom religion was underappreciated uh, in the American context and at the same time the American way of dealing with the issue is underappreciated by Muslims as well especially in the Muslim world mm -hmm. so this was an opportunity to really explore those uh, those things and 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 make a, a constructive comparison yes and I think, I think you did an excellent job uh, on it. Um, would you explain the two, two um, protection clauses in the First Amendment and, you know, the protection clause and the Establishment Clause? Yes, uh, freedom of religion is dealt with in the First Amendment of the Constitution mm -hmm. with two separate clauses. Uh, one is known as the Establishment Clause and the other is the Free Exercise Clause. Mm -hmm. um, the Free Exercise Clause is, is quite simply that the government, the Congress in particular, cannot in any way infringe on anyone's practice of their religion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the the, the uh, Establishment Clause is actually an anti-establishment or disestablishment clause mm -hmm. that says that there shall be no established religion. So mm -hmm. the, the, the Congress cannot establish a religion. It cannot say the United States is a Christian country. Mm -hmm. so you sometimes hear people say, mm -hmm. but that comes out of their mouths. It's, it doesn't come from the Congress, which is strictly prohibited from making any such declaration. This establishment clause, by the way, is quite unique. I don't think there is any other country on Earth, mm -hmm. uh, unless maybe some in, in recent years uh, some countries have changed, uh, that has a disestablishment clause. Every other country on Earth has some kind of es established religion. Even the late unlamented Soviet Union had atheism as its established religion. And England as well. Right? England has the Church of England. The Church of England. <laughs> it's, 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 it's interesting. I, I'd never thought about it from that perspective. Um, so, so tell me about about. I want to, to kind of focus in on this idea that's in the media right now 
called an Islamic State. I mean, we, we, we've been calling this group of people ISIS, but just the concept of Islamic State, is that something that you can, t you can inform us about? Um, there are some people like uh, Tariq Ramadan, uh, Professor Tariq Ramadan, who, who, uh, who thinks that um, there's no such thing as a religious, uh, as, as an Islamic State. Uh, matter of fact, he addresses uh, the countries that call themselves Islamic states as majority Muslim uh, countries. Uh, tell me, is that is something, something you can expand upon? Well, <clears throat> um, what does it mean? You want to ask the question before one answers, is there such a thing as an Islamic state? Yes. What does it mean? Yeah. And uh, it's a very, very hard concept to get your hands around. Yeah. Most people who use the term are people who mean a state which will impose Islamic law. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if, if that's the meaning of an Islamic state, mm -hmm. it's still hard to answer because what is Islamic law? There are, Islam is not monolithic. The understanding of Islamic law is multifarious. In the biggest branch of Islam, which is Sunni Islam, which is adhered to by 85 or 90 percent of all the Muslims in the world, mm -hmm. there are four recognized schools of thought that differ in their interpretation on Islamic law. Mm -hmm. So if you had an Islamic state, so-called Islamic state, that imposed one of these interpretations of Islamic law, mm -hmm. it wouldn't actually be an Islamic state, it would be a Hanafi state or yeah. a Maliki state or... Mm -hmm. um, but there's another problem more profound. I would argue, because of the nature of the state, mm -hmm. that you cannot define an Islamic state in terms of whether or not it imposes Islamic law. To me, the only possible constructive meaning of an Islamic state would be a state that obeyed Islamic law, mm -hmm. not one that imposes it. Now, what, why do I say this? Uh, I'd say it because of my understanding of the nature of law. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, what law means to a scientist, what it means to a legislator, mm -hmm. what it means to a theologian are different things. In Islam, because we believe that God has created all the laws of the heavens and the earth, including those that govern human societies, mm -hmm. our understanding of law is more similar to that of the scientist. Mm -hmm. Law is something that has to be discovered. God creates it, man mm -hmm. discovers it, mm -hmm. and man obeys it, doesn't impose it. Mm -hmm. For example, and I know I've mentioned this to you before, but the idea of the law of gravity. Right. I believe in the law of gravity, but I would never speak about imposing the law of gravity mm -hmm. on anybody. Mm -hmm. The law of gravity is there to be obeyed. If we obey it, then we'll be able to do all kinds of wonderful things. We'll be able to make progress in the scientific and technological sense. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we disobey it, we'll jump off a cliff and kill ourselves. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and I believe the very same thing is true of the uh, Islamic law. So when, so if, 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 what is this? So Islamic law is, an Islamic state then is not one that imposes, say, certain set of punishments for people who have sinned, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it is God who will punish the sinners. Yes, yes. But rather an Islamic state is one that obeys the justice provisions and requirements of Islam, that does not engage in cruelty, aggression, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And so on. Uh, interesting. I, I, um, hmm. That's a very interesting way of expressing it. Um, you have written that the concept of free exercise of religion is well established in Islamic law. Uh, having been, uh, it was actually more respected now uh, than it was back in medieval Europe. It's actually in classical civilizations. Uh, it's, uh, this idea in the West, it's, yes. it's more respected now than it was in medieval. It was, it was, it was, it, it was. In fact, uh, I think that's what you're saying. The classical Islamic civilization was 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 uh, respected religious freedom uh, greater than the medieval Europe. Is, 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 is that something you agree with now? <laughs> Please explain. Well, unfortunately, the, the situation's been reversed, but, mm, yeah. <clears throat> but I would say in the medieval era, definitely, and the, you know, I could give you one, the, there, there are many examples one could give, but I think there's one that's kind of um, an obvious example, or should be obvious, mm. uh, because it's, uh, it, it's, un, it's, it's undisputed, and it's very clear cut, and that is the treatment of the Jews. Jews were a minority both in the Muslim world and in Christian Europe. Right. And how were they treated? Mm. 
well, uh, you know, it would be an exaggeration to say they were always treated fairly and justly under the Muslims, but the 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 uh, injustices they may have suffered were pre petty compared to the wholesale persecution yeah. that they underwent under the uh, Christians. Right. This is most clearly seen when you look at Spain, hmm. because in Spain you have the same population, yeah. you see, they're the same people, and you look at how they were treated under 800 years of Muslim rule, mm -hmm. and then what happened when the Christians reconquered Spain. Mm -hmm. And what happened, of course, was the, the Jews were eventually thrown out, mm -hmm. <laughs> those that were not, uh, that were not killed, uh, and mm -hmm. they were put in, into an exile. Well, in the Muslim world, uh, they were not only living already and, mm -hmm. and, and prospering, mm -hmm. but the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire sent letters to every rabbi in Spain inviting them to come and bring their communities to the Ottoman Empire where he promised them that they would be as, that if they would just pay their taxes they could be free to practice their religion mm -hmm. free to raise their families and free to earn a living mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. and it's interesting by the way that uh, when uh, the Sultan uh, got a, a letter from a um, admirer of King Ferdinand, mm -hmm. he wrote back and said, that, this king whom you admire is impoverishing his kingdom while enriching mine, mm. referring to the flight of the Jews I from see. Spain yes. to the Ottoman yes. land. Yes, I, um, I think this is true. And I, uh, now, tell me about a little bit about uh, the Prophet Muhammad's um, Medina Charter um, uh, with this provision for Jews to, to run their uh, govern their lives with Jewish law. Uh, with Jewish law. Yeah, well, the the Medina Compact yeah. was an agreement for the governance of Mecca, mm -hmm. and in it, it explicitly said that the Jews would be uh, 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 subject to Jewish law, mm -hmm. and the laws that applied to Muslims would not apply to them, mm -hmm. uh, and that they would be uh, uh, only judged by uh, Muhammad. Of course, was the chief judge of Mecca, mm -hmm. but he would judge them if there was a dispute between a Muslim and a Jew. But as far as their internal affairs were concerned, they would continue to be self-governing and would be judged by, uh, and would, would have the Jewish law applied to them. Yes, and I understand that there was an act of treason that was, that was uh, committed by a, a community of Jews that, that eventually had to go to a triumph uh, uh, under Islamic law, and, uh, or, or, or was it? Uh, were, they, were they judged on Islamic law? Well, there were, there were three cases, uh, mm -hmm. there were three tribes in, of Jews in Medina, yeah. uh, actually in the suburbs of Medina, but they were covered by the Medina Compact. And uh, each one of them, one by one, violated the terms of the agreement and sided with the Quraysh, the pagans who were fighting against the Muslims. Mm -hmm. Um, in the first uh, two cases, they were tried under Islamic law, and they were exiled, and they uh, were allowed to take all their movable property with them, but of course they lost their lands, which they had to abandon. Mm -hmm. uh, it was only with the third tribe, which refused to submit to the prophet's adjudication, mm -hmm. and demanded that a judge of their choice be allowed to try them. Mm -hmm. And they right. asked for a man who was not a Jew, yeah. Uh, n nor as far as they knew a Muslim, although the Hadith are contradictory on that. Mm -hmm. he, but he ha certainly had been a pagan up to that time, mm -hmm. uh, and it, although he eventually became a Muslim. Anyway, but this man was someone who had been an ally of theirs <coughs> mm -hmm. and happened to be very knowledgeable of Jewish law. Mm -hmm. And he judged them according to the Old Testament. And okay. the Old Testament, the punishment for treason, is that the men shall be put to death and the women and children taken into slavery. Yeah, yes. Uh, I know there are a lot of people who point to, to that, uh, to those incidents and declare Islam not a, a uh, religion that respects uh, law. Um, I was curious to, to ask you, would you give us an example of the legal and cultural uh, comparisons of the establishment um, and the freedom exercise clauses from American and Muslim vantage points. So you have two different vantage points, the American perspective on this and the uh, Muslim uh, perspective on this. <clears throat> well, let's, uh, let's talk about free exercise because that's one where I can take examples from both cultures. Mm -hmm. um, in uh, uh, American law, um, the, it is clear cut that Congress cannot 
interfere with the free exercise of religion, yeah. um, which has been interpreted by the American legal scholars, by the courts, yeah. to say that uh, in order, before you can violate the free exercise of religion clause, mm -hmm. you have to meet what's called a strict scrutiny test. And that means that two conditions must be fulfilled. If, if a law of general applicability should infringe on someone's free exercise of religion, mm -hmm. it must be justified, number one, that it meets some compelling governmental interest, and number two, that it meets that interest in the least restrictive means possible. Mm -hmm. um, so as a result, uh, you will see many um, lawsuits, for example, whether a prisoner in a federal prison can grow a beard. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, the, the, the prison cannot simply say, you can't have a beard. Mm -hmm. Because he can say, well, my religion motivates me to have a beard. It is encouraged for men to grow beards, and so I'm going to grow my beard. Mm -hmm. uh, the, prison has to, the prison has to do two things. First off, it has to give a reason, a compelling reason, mm -hmm why he shouldn't be allowed to have a beard. So in the actual cases, now you go to the case law and you look at well, what are the arguments they made, mm -hmm. they would say, because he can hide contraband in the beard, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. um, well, even if the courts accept that argument, they still have to meet the second one. Have you met that requirement in the least restrictive means possible? Mm -hmm. Can't you just trim the beard so that you can't hide a gun in it mm, mm, <laughs> right, right, <laughs> or, or, or a razor blade which would sort of <laughs> defeat the purpose of the beard I guess but yeah and uh, and invariably the courts have said you can't meet you've not, not met that requirement mm -hmm. and invariably it sides with they side with freedom of religion yeah. where there has been a problem in American law has been whether this requirement of strict scrutiny should be applied to the states mm. because the the First Amendment just says Congress shall pass no law mm -hmm. abridging the freedom of religion. It doesn't say anything about the state legislators. Right, gotcha. Mm. So this became an issue with the notorious Smith decision. Yes. Uh, when a Native American named Smith yes. uh, had uh, uh, been disqualified from getting his unemployment insurance because he smoked peyote, which was a religious requirement of his tribe. And uh, the uh, argument was made by his lawyers that uh, the, the, uh, the argument was made by the state that he was guilty of moral turpitude mm -hmm. and therefore shouldn't qualify for unemployment. The argument of his attorneys was you, this is a religious requirement on his part and you cannot abridge it unless you meet the strict scrutiny test. Mm -hmm. Uh, the state argued th that it uh, th that it had met the strict scrutiny test. It said that uh, that drugs are such a horrible problem mm -hmm. that we have a compelling reason to ban it and they said and uh, that they uh, uh, but then there was still the question well have you have you dealt with it in the least restrictive means possible since the amount of peyote that they use in the ceremonies it's like the wine Catholics use when they take their communion mm -hmm. they're not you're not going to get drunk on it he was not going to get high off that small quantity of peyote mm -hmm. so that was the argument and in fact the state lost in the federal court in Oregon okay. but the state appealed to the Supreme Court because the governor was a drug warrior, wanted to get credits uh, for being hard on drugs. Okay. So he went to the federal courts and the Supreme Court made its decision and shocked everyone when in a 5-4 decision, it ruled that not that the state had met the requirement, mm -hmm. but that the, it didn't have to meet the requirement. For religious the, the, the court, the mm -hmm. court ruled that strict scrutiny doesn't apply to freedom of religion. Mm -hmm and that it was sufficient that the law was of general intent. They said, had the, had the law been aimed at Native Americans in particular, mm -hmm. then it would be unconstitutional. But since the law said nobody can use peyote, mm -hmm. the fact that it happens to affect them more than others, mm -hmm. that's just too bad. Mm -hmm. Now, to get Muslim, your Muslim audience members to understand this, it is as if they passed a law saying you have to eat pork. Mm -hmm. And people would say, but this is against Islam. And they'd say, well, but we didn't say Muslims have to eat pork. We said everybody has to eat pork. And so it's not against Islam. Muslims just happen to be adversely affected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Be the, the way the court decision was written, it was practically an invitation for activists for religious freedom to go to the Congress and ask Congress to pass a law to reinstitute the strict scrutiny test, mm -hmm. which Congress did. 
by an overwhelming vote, unanimous in the, in the lower house and 97 to one in the Senate. Mm. Well, then the first test of that happened in Bernie, Texas, where a Catholic church wanted to expand, but the zoning laws said they couldn't expand. But they were now too small to hold the growing Catholic population. Mm -hmm. The Catholics are a minority in Texas, and so the Protestant population of Bernie was not inclined to change the zoning law. So they sued under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, mm -hmm. saying you haven't met the strict scrutiny test. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it went to the Supreme Court, and uh, uh, the uh, again uh, the, the the court the court ruled against religious freedom, mm -hmm. essentially splitting on the issue of is religious freedom a fundamental right to which scr scrutiny has to be applied in the case of the states. Mm -hmm. Sandra Day O'Connor argued it was. Antonin Scalia argued it was not. Yes, yes. And he says it, that is the risk of living in a democracy. That basically. is precisely what he, what he said. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, of course, that's why we have the First Amendment, ah. is to protect, <laughs> protect the minorities no. from the majority. <laughs> and furthermore, it's why I have the 14th Amendment, which applied that ruling, originally written to apply to Congress, mm -hmm. to the states. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, what would we do with a similar case in in the, in the Islamic world or in a Muslim culture? Now, in the Muslim culture, we uh, don't appeal uh, uh, to the constitutions of the countries, right, right. but to the Quran, mm -hmm. where the Quran makes a very flat and sweeping statement, la ikraha fi din, that there be no compulsion in religion. Yes. Yes. So, the idea that a majority can impose its will on a minority on religious matters mm -hmm. is clearly mm -hmm. ex precluded by mm -hmm. the by the Quran. Now, yeah. there is a dispute in the Muslim world about does this rule, which seems to be written in a perfectly general statement, mm -hmm. does it apply to everybody, or does it apply only to the Abrahamic faiths? I see. Mm -hmm. And well, some it doesn't make that extinction. I mean, it doesn't make that extinction in the Quran. It, it doesn't. But yeah. they appeal to another verse, which says, uh, 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 when when the people uh, 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 the, that the people of the book mm -hmm. shall be free to practice their religion. I see. As long as they pay the jizya, mm -hmm. and the jizya is of course the tax. tax now right. the question mm -hmm. is, is it only the people of the book who are subject to the jizya, mm. or is it? any religious minority. Mm. In practice, Islamic uh, rulers have given that jizya payment and the protection that comes with it mm -hmm. to all religious minorities, starting with the Zoroastrians mm -hmm. in Persia, mm -hmm. uh, who, although they would argue that they are monotheists, are not Abrahamic, in that Abraham is not one of their prophets. Yes, yes. But, um, in an important sense, they do believe in only one God. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the Hindus? Yeah. Hinduism would seem to be a polytheistic religion, although in fact, if you speak to Hindu scholars, they will say there's really only one Godhead mm -hmm. of which the different gods and goddesses are manifestations. Sure. Um, but the thing is, if we look at the practice of the prophet, peace be upon him, we see that he did not discriminate in this way. When he conquered Mecca, yeah. He gave a general amnesty that applied to everybody, whether they had converted to Islam or not. Just, whether they were, yeah. there weren't many Christians or Jews in Mecca anyway, so mm -hmm. that, that was not even an issue. The people were polytheists. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so even though polytheism was now, uh, you know, uh, no longer a part of Meccan life, mm -hmm. as an individual, mm -hmm. one could still believe whatever you wanted to believe and there was no uh, mm -hmm. uh, retribution taken against them. So even if the m Muslims are in majority, they are they have limits in in the idea of uh, of uh, uh, of religions uh, or religious freedom, I should say. Um, uh, what I want to say is that they cannot impose Islam on the general population. Yeah, the question is right? not whether free exercise is part of Islamic law, yeah. but what are the limits to it? Right. And so right. there's where you get the arguments, and there's where you'll see people like the Saudis will say that uh, Christians and Jews should not be allowed to openly practice their religion in mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you will say, okay, well, what, what's your argument 
since it seems to go against the general principle of right. free exercise. And they will say, the prophet, peace be upon him, said, the devil has given up hope of being worshipped in your land. <laughs> you say, well, you see, even if you apply, if you say this should apply to Satanists, <laughs> right, I right. suppose you can make that <laughs> argument, it has nothing to do with Jews or Christians. Yes, yes, yes. So it, these are very weak arguments in my mm -hmm. humble opinion. Yes. Uh, but uh, they are the arguments that people are using. I have seen uh, images of, of organizations like ISIS that would go actually door to door to see people, whether people were selling alcohol or whether they had pornography or whether women were wearing dresses too short and uh, in public and whether single women were uh, in the company of single men in public as well. Uh, is, and, and they were chastised for it. Is this, in your opinion, uh, part and parcel of the of the Islamic view of of, uh, of this. Is Islam uh, governs the uh, both the public and the private sphere. Right. But it gives the state no role in the governance of the private sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, the right of privacy, it's interesting, is hardwired into Islamic law sure. because it was recognized from the very beginning. We have as early, certainly as early as uh, Omar, mm -hmm. uh, may God be pleased with him, who when a man came to him and charged that his neighbor was drinking wine, yes. and Omar said, well, I've never seen this man drink wine. And he mm -hmm. said, well, I looked in his window and in his house he was mm -hmm. drinking wine. And Omar mm -hmm. said, then you are in the wrong because you have no right to look into his window like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So it is the right of privacy that is protected. Now in American law, it's not, it's the right of privacy is debated. It's not an enumerated right. Mm -hmm. Now there, of course, the Constitution defends unenumerated rights, and so the question becomes, is it an unenumerated right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the court held in a very important case, the contraception case, that it is an unenumerated right, and that it's nobody's business if a woman wants to buy contraceptives, it's mm -hmm. between her and her doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are others who say otherwise, uh, as leading an authority as Judge Bork, argued against that argument, saying that there is no absolute right to privacy, that it's something in the, uh, you know, in the penumbra of mm -hmm. other rights. Mm -hmm. So just as in the Muslim world, people will argue about what are the limits on, on free exercise, mm -hmm. uh, in the Western world, in America, you have arguments about the limits of privacy. I want to get this question in for, about Turkey uh, uh, denying uh, women to wear hijab in public space. And, in uh, official buildings and uh, on college campuses. Um, I don't know if that's changed or not, but that's that was changed. the last report. Yeah, you know That's what? changed, right. Okay, please well, explain, because the well, last interview that I've, I've actually lectured, uh, uh, actually lectured a uh, tape was, was scholars saying the, the contrary. But. Oh, okay, well, uh, maybe they know something I don't, but, but things have been changing in Turkey since the ascension of the Justice and, and Development Party. Sure. Uh, and it is true, um, uh, perhaps what they meant is that the law actually hasn't been repealed yet, mm. Uh, mm. but I don't think the law is being enforced. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, and uh, to the contrary, uh, many uh, secular Turks uh, are concerned because there's a rising social pressure now for women to cover mm -hmm. their hair. Mm -hmm. uh, it's as yet not a legal requirement, I but see. they're afraid it'll become one. Yes, yes. So they were trying to play ahead of the game, so to speak. This is this has been very interesting, Dr. Maladine Ahmed. I just uh, just a quick question: what what book would you recommend a student read if they want to know more about this? A single book about this subject? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I uh, I guess if you want to know about religious tolerance in Islam. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably the best book to read might be um, the, uh, I'm trying to remember who the author is, but I think it's called The Preaching of Islam. The Preaching of Islam. Yeah. I, I, will, I will pull that up and see if we can find it. Dr. Melanie, thank you for coming to the Scholar's Chair. I deeply appreciate it. Um, we have been talking about religious freedom with Dr. Madadine Ahmed. He is the director of the Minaret of Freedom Institute. Uh, you can see more programs online with, uh, in the YouTube Read One uh, channel. You can also follow us on Facebook. Uh, so if you want to see us next week, we'll see you next week. I am Khalil Shadid. Good night.
Amazing.